ce que nous savons, et là nous en sommes absolument certains, c'est que nous ne sommes pas les parents de ces deux enfants. C'est un cauchemar. C'est vrai que cette affaire nous dépasse totalement. On ne comprend pas ce qui nous arrive. This is Crime Dog. Roll the intro. Jean-Louis Corjo is home alone in his apartment in Seoul, while his family is back in France for the holidays. Originally from the northwest of France, Jean-Louis, an engineer, moved to Korea for professional reasons in 2002 with his wife Véronique and their two kids. He's currently taking Korean lessons and his teacher just told him about a great recipe he should try. So he goes to the market to buy some mackerel. When he gets home, he puts some of the fish in the fridge and attempts to stock the rest in his freezer. He opens the freezer door, but he's struggling to find a spot to store it in. It's not until he opens the last drawer where he sees a plastic bag with a towel inside. He takes the bag out and to his horror, he sees a small human hand. In the same drawer, there is a second bag. In it, he finds a baby. In a blind panic and in his broken Korean, he calls the police. The two dead infants are taken away by Korean authorities. A few days later, Jean-Louis has joined up with the rest of his family in France when the DNA results come back. Jean-Louis and Véronique Corjo are the biological parents of the two baby boys found in the freezer. On the 22nd of August, the shocked couple hold a press conference, during which they dispute the DNA results and deny any involvement. French authorities quickly take over the case and perform further DNA tests, arriving at the same conclusion. Faced with the undeniable evidence, less than 24 hours go by before Véronique Corjo cracks. On October the 12th, 2006, she confesses to being the mother and killing the two babies who were born in Seoul in 2002 and 2003, meaning they've been in the freezer for four and three years respectively. She also admits to killing a third baby in 1999 when the couple still lived in France, watching it burn in their fireplace for over four hours after her two other kids had gone to school. Regarding the babies found in the freezer, she says she recalls on both occasions having contractions and then giving birth on her own in the bath. She also claims her husband knew nothing about these pregnancies, which they find hard to believe. They questioned Jean-Louis to find out how much he knew about all of this. They asked him that when he recognized the towel that one of the babies was wrapped in, why he didn't call his wife to find out what the hell was going on. He replies that he didn't suspect for a second that his wife knew anything about the babies in the freezer, or even that she was their mother as she'd undergone a hysterectomy at the end of 2003. It didn't cross his mind for a second. That's why he was so adamant that there must have been some kind of mistake when the Korean authorities released their DNA results. He refuses to believe it. But how could he have not seen that his wife was pregnant? Twice. Three times, in fact, including the baby she put in the fire in 1999. They ask him some pretty intimate questions about his relationship with his wife to try and understand how he failed to notice she was pregnant. There'll be more on this later. In spite of what she'd done, he stands by his wife the entire time. It's also a great soulagement because I'll be able to consacrate entirely to support my wife que j'aime et on va la soutenir à trois avec mes enfants qui n'attendent qu'une seule chose c'est son retour. When questioned by officers he said he felt guilty for calling the police effectively condemning his wife in the process. Allegedly in 99 he had his suspicions that his wife was pregnant but when he asked her she straight out denied it. He took her word for it and never asked her again. Jean-Louis parents can't believe it either. They'd seen how Véronique was with the two kids and couldn't imagine her doing anything like this. In their eyes she was a loving devoted mother. Véronique reveals that she was shocked but relieved when she found out the babies had been discovered. But why did she keep the bodies for so long? Even taking the risk of moving them when the family moved house in 2005. She claims the freezer was a temporary place to keep them because she didn't know where to bury them. She was scared of being caught. They ask her why didn't she have an abortion if she didn't want the children. Her husband was so supportive of her, he probably would have just gone along with it. The couple are allowed a face-to-face -face meeting during which she breaks down. He tells her she must have gone through hell to be brought to do what she did. His devotion to her is unwavering. The trial begins on June the 9th, 2009, and it becomes clear that Veronique is a deeply troubled soul. 
She tells the court that she was confused and was trying to understand herself what she had done. She claims to have killed them because she didn't want to have any more children and didn't tell her husband because she thought he would want to keep them. She states that she was aware of her pregnancies. She suffered nausea. She had noticed that she had missed her periods also. And during the last few months of pregnancy, she had refused to be intimate with her husband. They ask her why during a period where she didn't work, did she have someone look after her kids five days a week? She replies that she simply liked the peace and quiet. Perhaps she couldn't handle the responsibility of a large family like the one she grew up in. This lack of emotion and disregard for the murdered babies is in stark contrast to how she treated her other children. Apparently when one of her kids was sick, she didn't sleep for months out of worry. Her devotion to her two living kids seems rock solid. Everyone who steps up to the stand says the same thing. She was a devoted mother. It doesn't make sense. She comes across like such a nice person. When you hear her responses at the trial, especially, you get a real sense of immense sadness emanating from her. She is clearly suffering. The goal is to try and find out why. To understand her desolation, we have to go back to her childhood. She grew up in the countryside as one of seven kids. Her mother was constantly exhausted and struggled to manage the vineyard while looking after all the children. Veronique's siblings, who were also questioned during the trial, would say they would often see their mother leaving the dinner table crying. It seems like a classic 70s old school family upbringing with little communication or affection. They never celebrated birthdays. She didn't even have any idea when her parents were born. We also discover a family secret during the trial. Veronique's mother had three other brothers and sisters who died in we don't know what circumstances. This not knowing, this lack of communication weighs on the shoulders of the children. Her sister backs her up, claiming they were both sad, not really living. They both felt worthless. Her brother states that he had very few memories of his sister growing up, that in many family photos she was missing and he felt guilty for putting her to one side. The family lived in secrets. There used to be just five kids, but they found out one day that they had two half sisters. Her mom had two kids that she'd hidden from the whole family. And one day they just showed up at the family home. She became increasingly isolated and spent most of her time in a room reading, escaping reality. Her mom states that she didn't mean to have such a large family. They didn't use contraception back then. At the time, if you got pregnant, you kept the baby. Before the trial, she was asked what color Veronique's eyes were. She said blue when actually they are green. It gives the impression of a detached mother, oblivious to the negative impact her behavior was having on her children. The judge attempts to get Veronique to admit to hiding the pregnancy, but she claims she just didn't tell anyone she was pregnant, a big distinction in her eyes. Several psychiatric reports were presented during the trial and they played a huge role in the outcome. They state that she was trying to understand herself why she had done this. That's why she made contradictory statements during her interrogation. She was being forced to confront what she'd done. She'd never really reflected on it before. And now she finds herself having to explain it. She finds it hard enough to explain it to herself, never mind to other people. Another psychiatrist would go on to say she wasn't at all how she expected her to be. She had been portrayed in the media as some kind of monster, but the person she met was a fragile, broken individual. The question we have to ask is, can you kill someone in cold blood without being a monster? A monster doesn't exist, but our past can make us do monstrous things. None of the doctors suggest she's not responsible for her actions, but they don't think she took any pleasure in the killing. She didn't intentionally fall pregnant to kill the baby. They all conclude that she is in pregnancy denial. She doesn't feel like she's pregnant. It's her disturbing past which comes to the surface during the pregnancy and the labor. And it's through guilt that she keeps them in the freezer so that someone finds them. The experts explain that one in 500 pregnancies is in denial. A woman is unaware that she is pregnant, often through fear of being pregnant or fear of having a child. In such a case, the woman's body will physically conceal the pregnancy, with the baby growing hidden almost inside the womb, which could explain why Jean-Louis didn't suspect much. In fact, the denial could even spread to other members of the family. In 99, when he realized she might be pregnant and she said no, he didn't push the point. He just accepted her answer to be the truth, even though it seemed obvious. When in denial, the pregnancy is unusual as is giving birth. It's quite common for the woman to give birth by herself. And they suggest it's very easy as if the body was just getting rid of something. Veronique didn't have the impression she was killing a human being. It's as if she was getting rid of a part of herself. 
the French Association for the Recognition of Pregnancy Denial have been calling for this phenomenon to be recognized as an illness and not a crime when it results in a child's death like this case. Despite the judge really going after Veronique during the trial, the verdict is pretty lenient. In fact, they only request a sentence of 10 years. After seven hours of deliberation, the verdict is read out and she's sentenced to eight years in prison. Less than a year after the verdict, an application for parole is made. And after three years and eight months, Veronique leaves prison. Her husband wrote a book about what happened in an attempt to explain the unexplainable. They both undergo regular therapy sessions as they attempt to rebuild their family. Let me know in the comments what you think. Should this condition be considered an illness which requires medical care? Or is Veronique Kojo a cold-blooded killer who deserved a heavier sentence? This video is dedicated to Thomas and Alexandre, the name given by the couple's two living children to the two babies found dead in the freezer in Seoul, and also to the third baby who never got to experience life and was killed in 1999. If you found this case interesting, like and subscribe to our channel. Support us on Patreon and check out this equally disturbing video about a serial killer who defied French authorities for 35 years. Until next time, stay safe and look after yourselves.